Tom Clancy is known for such books as The Hunt for the Red October, Patriot Games, and Clear and Present Danger. With 11 best-selling novels under his belt, he is credited with single-handedly creating the techno-thriller literary genre. His affiction has crossed over to film, television, and video games. In his new novel, The Bear and the Dragon, his frequent hero, Jack Ryan, returns as a president faced with conflicts from Russia and China. I am pleased to have him back at this table. The first thing he wants to say is, I did not create a genre called techno-thriller because that's not what I do. Well, no, actually, Mike Crichton invented it when he wrote The Andromeda Strain. Ah. And Mike, uh, obviously, is a very fine writer. And he was the first first guy, at least to my knowledge, who who gave a technical milieu uh, to, to the substance of his writing. And so if anybody's guilty of that, it's Mike. Good guy. It? He's a good guy, by the way. This is a big book. This is over a thousand pages. Uh, I never thought I'd finish the damn thing. Yeah. Is that right? Right. Yeah. Now I I talked to you about reviews when you sat down. I've mm -hmm. seen a number of very good reviews. People saying this is the best thing you've done since you know the first couple Hunt for Red October and they always and, say that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And they, they, they never were the ones. But then they say other good there. things about storytelling and the, and, mm -hmm. and the characters are better drawn and that kind of stuff. Now obviously you said there've been other reviews that are not they're not all, you know, not all glowing. Or glowing. No. But how do you feel about this piece of work? I think it's pretty decent. Yeah. I mean, you should never ask an author that because obviously he's not going to say he's got ugly kids. Well, no, either, some authors yeah. did, but it took you a thousand pages to tell your story. That's a complex story. Right. You know, the way I work is I, mean, I don't have an outline. I don't have a preset length of the book. I just yeah. follow the story till it gets to the end, and that's where I, that's where the book stops. All right, let me pick up the story. Here is the story. There is a president of the United States, who, by the way, is Jack Ryan. Jack has mm, had a Jack, very good yeah. career. He's He's been in CIA, he's been a, a professor, he's a former Navy man, right? A Marine. Marine. Yep. And he... Uh, Wall Street. Wall Street. Made uh, some money there. Yep. Lectured at the Naval Academy. Yep. And he is now president. What kind of president is he? Reluctant. Uh, Jack got roped into this in, in 1980, 1994 when I wrote uh, Dead of Honor. Um, and he sort of stuck with a job. He, you know, Jack Ryan's kind of like... He was then vice president. Uh, well, yeah, he, he he accepted the vice presidency right. as a way out of government, right. not as a way in. You know, Jack is uh, sort of like um, Cary Grant or Jimmy Stewart in a Hitchcock movie. He just gets dropped into the into the unpleasant material and has to fight his way out and try to make a little bit of order out of chaos as he goes. And the chaos he now finds itself is that China is reeling from problems. Well, China's really, what happens is China's greedy. The, the, the Russians discover uh, large deposits of gold and oil in eastern Siberia which actually is a, is a likelihood rather than just fiction. Yeah. And the Chinese think, yeah, I wish we had that, and, and, and start a war of aggression. Also, but, well, but there are reasons that, that it needs it, too, right? I mean, it's well, they're under some trade difficulties with us, yes. Because of Taiwan. That's part of it, yeah. yeah. Now, don't be, come on, you're being, you're, you're not... Well, if you give the whole book away, people won't buy it, Charlie. Well, we've got to set up the premise. Okay. I mean, the premise is, is that all of a sudden, China is invading... Russia. Correct. Yes. All right. That's your premise. And so what does America do? We have to, we come in on the side of Russia because Russia becomes a member of NATO. All right. So there is a story that we're telling. Uh, where did the story come from in your head? What was it that precipitated Well, it's an outgrowth this? of my last uh, couple of novels um, where China has been behind the scenes manipulating other nations to cause trouble for the United States, and this time they decided to do it on their own. Do you think the great rivalry of this century will be the United States and China? No, China's, uh, as a practical matter, China's not a threat to the United States for the simple reason that there's a big blue space between us and China called the Pacific Ocean. And the Chinese do not have a navy worthy of the name. Nor do they until, have. until they become a maritime power, they can't be a major threat to us. Even in an, in, in an era of nuclear weapons? Oh, they, the, the Chinese have something between 10 and 20 uh, weapons, ballistic weapons, some of which are probably aimed at the United States, but only 10 or 20, we carry 20. 24 launchers on every single one of our Trident submarines, mm. each one of which has uh, with uh, six or eight warheads aboard. So if, if it came to a nuclear confrontation between us and China, uh, it'd be bad for everybody, but it'd be really bad yeah, for yeah, China. But I mean, you basically says I'm not, not going to be a great rivalry. We have nothing to fear because of the sea between us. Essentially, yes. And also, you know, countries uh, launch a, a war of aggression, Charlie, is just a great big armed robbery. You know, Hitler attacked Poland for the same reason somebody holds up a liquor store in the South Bronx. He wants the money. Right. Uh, they don't have anything they can take from us, or we we have nothing which they can take from us, and they don't have anything that's ter terribly interesting to us. So there's no real structural reason for us to be enemies, except of course for their ideology, and 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 you know they're still Marxists, and Marxism 
is sort of a is is a perverse messianic uh, political philosophy that that creates enemies where they don't need to be enemies. The idea for this again, my repeat my question came from what? Just it's an outgrowth of the two previous Ryan novels. Yeah. Is it that easy? It just is a natural outgrowth. Have you been touching on themes? I wouldn't call it easy. I mean, the, the three novels together compromise probably about thirty six hundred manuscript pages. Actually, you know, quite a bit more yeah. than I should think. Uh, but I wouldn't call it easy. But it's just a logical expansion of the, pr of the previous two. Yeah. John Clark is back in this. Oh, John's around. Yeah, he's around. He called. He's called into action in this. Uh sort of, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it easier or harder for you now, now that you've got these characters developed, now you know who they are? All you got to do is sort of think about what kind of trouble do I want to put them in. Well, it, it becomes easier insofar as you know everything gets easier with practice, whether it's golf or or shooting ducks or driving a car. It gets harder because uh, your expectations rise a little bit more quickly than, than your abilities rise. I mean, I I, I have to produce. Um, a good product for my uh, for my readers, and I, I try to do a little bit better every time. And fortunately, it gets harder and harder to do do better because the expectation level or what? Well, my expectations more than anyone else's. I mean, I, I you set goals for yourself, and the goals aren't always realistic. But you try to meet them anyway. Mm -hmm. How much research did you have to do for this? I mean, there's a lot of in you have to know something about Siberia, the, prob the probability that there's oil and gold and whatever's beneath Siberia. It wasn't really all that hard to do. I didn't, didn't, didn't just reading the headlines of the paper delivers this to essentially, you. Essentially, yeah. You try to keep track of what's going on in the world. I watch yeah. CNN and oh, come, you're you're giving me a hard time. You, in in a sense that that it's not. You do more than that. You talk to a lot of people. Oh yeah. You're mm -hmm. constantly engaging people. You know, you're curious by nature. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. You know, and so you're out to figure out things that can feed your characters and your drama and to make. Okay. Your story interesting. All my books are, are generally based on one contemporary reality in one way or another. And, um, you know, I sort of just sort of expand upon real possibilities that are, that are evident in, in everyday news. And so I keep track of what's going on in the world. Like I said, I watch CNN, I read the Washington Post, the Washington Times. I, I prowl the Internet, and um, I get, you know, through AOL now, I get access to, to uh, British papers, the Telegraph and the Times, which right. I like. And um, just try to keep keep apprised of what's going on in the world. There's I mean, some politics in this, too, isn't it? Opinions bit, on Social yeah. Security and other things. Well, that Social Security I just sort of allude to. Yeah. When you look around, what is it that you worry most about the United States in terms of its military preparation and its military readiness? Sure. The last eight years, the U.S. military has been, you know, slashed and burned by about 40 percent. And yet, it's had increased missions, and, and you, they, you know, they talk about how you do more with less. No, you do less with less. You, know, you don't take forty percent out of Social Security and then pay all the benefits. That should be easy for people to understand. You don't take forty percent of your military power away and then do one hundred and fifty percent of the missions. You just can't do it. And as a result, uh, our, our readiness is, is hurting now. I mean, there, there's been a political football that's going back and forth. But the yeah. people I talk and to, the Joint in, Chiefs on one side, or the present Joint Chiefs on one side. Well, the Joint Chiefs, unfortunately, don't always get to tell the truth because they're, they're ordered to, to say what they have to say. And because they're loyal military officers who've sworn an oath to obey orders, they obey orders. Uh, but the fact of the matter is the U.S. military is hurting right now. And the, the two things you can change is either A, increase their funding and equipment, or B, cut back on their missions. Well, it seems like George Bush wants to do, who I assume is your candidate based on what you just said, wants to do both. He wants to cut back on the mission by, by not having American troops in the Balkans. He wants to have Europe assume more of that role. And at the same time, I wants don't know to see why more we, funding. I don't know why we put troops in the Balkans anyway. You know, my, my, my idea, and I put this in my books, is bef before we deploy forces anywhere to perform any mission that puts them in harm's way, the President's got to know one thing. He's got to know what he's going to tell Mrs. Jones when her son's dead, and he has to explain to her why her son died. Until you know what you're going to say to Mrs. Jones, your son died, and here's the reason why it was important to America that your son should die. Until you know what to put in that letter, you don't send little Billy Jones out there to fight. It's that simple. You know, this is not an aesthetic exercise. When you put people in harm's way, people die. And losing one's life is a big deal, and you better have a good reason for it before you make that possible. And, and you don't think it's possible for a president to make that case? For the Balkans, whether you're talking about Bosnia or Nobody's whether you're talking done about it. Kosovo. I mean, if, if it's possible, Charlie, how come it hasn't been done? 
Well, I think they would argue that they had done that. The president, well, not in terms that I can understand. What is, the, what is our U.S. national interest? What is our vital national interest in Yugoslavia? I don't see that we have one. Well, the nobody, idea, buy, nobody drives Yugos I, anymore. I don't, want, I don't want to go this route because it will eat up a lot of our time, but right. I mean, the argument would be that it, that it threatened the stability of the region, number one. It had an overflow into Macedonia, Greece, Turkey, and, and that was a problem. Also, that was a moral um, imperative as well because of the nature of that. Clinton's now. You can come back and say, well, where was that moral imperative in Rwanda and other places? And that can never be a judge because you'll mm -hmm. make choices that are That's only That's also how we got into convenient. Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And, you know, and President Clinton was evidently not terribly interested in going there himself personally. And in view of the fact that he wasn't interested in going personally, why is he sending little Billy Jones to go to Yugoslavia? Back to my sense okay. of, of, the, of the military and, and what's going on. How is the... Did, did the war in Kosovo prove anything to you vis-a-vis -vis or, or in the Gulf War about, you wrote a book about this, or you had, we had a show about this, about the primacy of air power today? Well, air power, that's a very useful tool. It's not the only tool, but it's a useful tool. You know, with, uh, particularly in the last few years, the Air Force has been developing all sorts of nasty new weapons. I mean, I mean really nasty new weapons. I, I discussed some of them in, the, in this book that give you um, surveillance and kill capability over the battlefield that it, it, it seems like something from a science fiction movie. What do you worry most about in terms of your country? Do you worry more domestic questions or foreign questions? I think we're in a happy position right now that there is no strategic threat to America. I mean, and, and there's no law of God or nature that says yeah. we have to have an enemy. Missile defense. I mean, this comes back to a point you just made. Yep. When I interviewed George Bush, George W. Bush, the governor of Texas, you know, he said he'd very well consider sharing the technology for missile defense against single or, or isolated attacks from mm -hmm. rogue nations. You think we should share that technology if it's if it turns out that it will in fact work? Sure, why not? And why shouldn't it work? It's not really all that difficult to mission. Well, so far it hasn't. The tests have been, as you know, unsuccessful. Yeah, and, and usually when the Air Force builds a new airplane, the first couple will crash. Do they? Oh, yeah. yeah. The F-15 uh, fighter was the first Air, Air Force airplane. They didn't lose one during the testing process. It's the only time it's ever happened. Uh, the F-22, they didn't crash it. They bounced it off the ground real hard when it was brand new. I mean, it's, it's normal. So it's normal to, that something doesn't function perfectly the first time you roll it out of the factory. It's not a difficult thing to do, scientifically speaking. Just a matter of getting and cobbling the engineering parts together, right? And that's not, you know, it can be done. If we, you know, we, for God's sake, we put people on the moon with 1960s technology. How hard is it to shoot something out of the sky? Well, one at a time. Well, so far, I mean, a lot of scientists say very hard. Lots of them. There is not a unanimity among the scientific community about this. Hey, hey, Charlie. In the 1950s, they got some of the smartest people in America together for a co national conference. And all these smart this guys got... This is prior to... The, this is in the 1950s, when the top-of-the-line computer was something called ENIAC. Right. Okay. And they got together, and they thought very soberly, and they came out with saying that, that four computers like ENIAC could handle all the computational needs of the United States of America. Yeah. Now, that ENIAC computer had less power than the 1979 Apple II. In other words like this. Right, right. Okay. And we only need four for the whole country. I don't think so. There's more than four computers within 20 feet of where we're sitting. So you're convinced it'll work? Of course. It not only is so it... But, but, I mean, well, it's not... Whenever it's not, a scientist says something's impossible, he's wrong. It's like when a scientist says it's impossible, it's possible. Is that what you're when saying? When an old scientist says it can't be done, he's wrong. When a young scientist says it can, he's probably right. That's just the nature of science. You left... You, you have a new relationship. You've left your previous agent. You have a new relationship with Mike Ovitz. Yep. Yeah, I met Mike about five years ago when he was head of Disney, and, and there was some talk at the, of, of, of my alliance with, with Disney. It, it didn't work out. But from the first time we met, Mike and I just kind of hit it off. And he's a good guy. He's a really good guy, yeah, and he's really smart, and uh, I, mean, I have a lot of fun with him. Yeah, here's what's going to happen. We're going to see Jack Ryan everywhere now. I, mean, I hope so. With, <laughs> with mouse ears? <laughs> yeah. it's just everywhere. I mean, marketing, marketing. You will be doing stories that will be... And that's what he'll do for you, right? Jack Ryan and the Goblet of Fire. <laughs> uh, are you happy? 
when oh, the yeah. things are going well. Oh, things could not I be mean, going better. A new contract, big new contract. Some people thought you'd leave Putnam. You didn't. I'll never leave Putnam. I shouldn't say that, but the, the head of Putnam, Phyllis Grant, she's like, kind of like my Jewish mother. <laughs> and she is an absolutely wonderful gal. Okay. And, and brilliant at what she does, and she's a friend, for God's sake. You don't screw your friends. Well, did you screw your agent? Oh, it was just time for me to... Look, I made, he made a lot of money for me, and I made a lot of money for him, and so it was time to move on. Oh, well, how does Phyllis know you're not going to come to her one day and say it's time to move on? I gave her my word I wouldn't. He did? Yes. Early on? I mean, they were worried. Fairly they were pretty worried that you were going to go, so you didn't... She knows me better than that. Oh, it's easy for you to say that now, before you after you've signed the contract. They were plenty nervous no. that you were going to be. Phyllis them. Grant, Mike Ovitz was going to take you no, away no. from them. Phyllis Grant, is, there's a lady. She's not even a college graduate. Started off in business as Nelson Doubleday's secretary. Yeah, it's a great story. Grew into, you know, became known as the best editor in the business. Took take, took over Putnam, which is the tightest run ship on the street. Yeah. Uh, it's the best managed company in the publishing business. The most profitable company in the, on the, in the publishing business. Because they got business. you. But. Well, <laughs> even, even long before I got there, she was the best. She's the best there is. And she'll, she's the best there is because she's the best. Yeah. I love working, and she's a great gal, and I love working with her. $45 million for two books? No, I can't talk about that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> this, is this going to be number one? What do you think? Well, is, is, you mean national? Yeah. It already has been. It's already number one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How long did it, is it still there, or did it just go No, I think, it, I think it was number one for six or seven weeks. And then Th this is pretty heavy off. for a book to take around. I mean, it's this a deadly is a weapon, yeah. This is a deadly weapon, yeah. yeah. You're off and writing another one? Not yet. Oh, God. Mm. I looked. The, I was so late doing this. The thing was actually in production before I finished it. They were yeah, the, but you, the printer was actually printing the damn things before I finished it. And I want to relax and play some golf and just yeah. kick back and watch TV. And, you know, I'm a History Channel addict. Buy a sports team. I'm, I'm out of that business. You are? You don't want to do that anymore? No. I had my chance. Are you and, jealous about what Snyder's done at the Redskins? I mean, he... See, Chad, I grew up in Baltimore. That means I'd rather sell my children to the gypsies than be a Redskins fan. <laughs> when, I, not Charles, when, I, when I was a little kid, in St. Matthew's Parish in Baltimore. Yeah, I knew I could get you going. Okay. I knew. John, you know, lived in, our, lived in my parish. And John was a kind of yeah. Catholic, went to Mass every day. And when you were in the fourth grade, you see John and I in your church going yeah. to Mass. That is a big deal. Yeah, you bet. You bet. It, 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 it's like it'll, so, it'll make you believe in God. I if Johnny like, and I just believe in God, I'm there. Why do you think Marco Rami is from the Hunt for Red October is Lithuanian? <laughs> Because Johnny United was a Lithuanian. Lithuanian. Yeah. I didn't know that there. There's another fact I didn't know. And I've, I've met John a couple of times, and uh, just a marvelous guy. The yeah. best quarterback ever. Break lived. your heart when the Col Colts left in the middle of the night? Mm. <laughs> May Robert Ruth say, burn in hell. <laughs> You're kidding. All right, Tom Clancy, The Bear and the Dragon. Um, it's a great story. And no one does it like he does. He really does. Whatever the genre is called and whoever pioneered it, uh, he understands it. He knows stuff that uh, people are always amazed at. Thank you for coming. Much success. My pleasure, pleasure. sir. Good to see you. Right.